traverse to generate safe AI is just tremendous. There's so many contingencies in there that's probably only a single mind on the planet that could attack this. And then I met Eliezer the last time. He suggested that we postpone AI for a couple hundred years until we solve the AI problem. Uh, so I'm going to talk about something that is uh, in some sense much more narrow and uh, humble and down to earth. Uh, that is the question, how to build a motivated AI system at all and to do it uh, right here and right now. Let's see if we can get this HDMI to work. My computer thinks that it sees the projector, but it is not neutral. Thank you. There are things happening, just wait a moment. <coughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, work on my cognitive architecture is a collaborative effort. There are a number of people uh, that are involved in this. Uh, and I'm very grateful to uh, Ronnie D uh, Wiene, Dominic Valent, and Priska Hager, and uh, Jonas Kemper, who have contributed to the current uh, implementation of MicroSci. It's uh, the second one. And uh, I'm also very grateful to a number of other people and institutions that uh, are making this possible. That is, um, I'm uh, grateful to um, Dietrich Dörner, um, Aaron Sloman, Marvin Minsky, Stan Franklin, and many, many others that have uh, inspired the design of the architecture itself and have contributed ideas directly or indirectly to it. And um, I'm thankful to a number of institutions and places that are supporting this, like Humboldt University of Berlin, um, the Institute of Cognitive Science in Osnabrück, the Berlin School of Mind and Brain, and uh, currently the Harvard Program of Evolutionary Dynamics and the Media Lab that uh, allow me working on these things. Uh, I believe for what we are doing, let me see, um, we uh, need to build a system that combines universal representations, that is somehow grounded neurosymbolic representations that uh, integrate both symbolic and distributed aspects, and we ha need to have something like universal problem solving, that is the number of operators over these representations that facilitate planning, reflection, and logical reasoning, and uh, so on. And we will need to have a system that identifies goals autonomously, um, and this is what I would call universal motivation. And maybe we need something like emotion and affect if we want to understand how these things work in humans. And we need to build this into whole testable architectures, not just isolated components, because these things cannot be understood in isolation, I think. Um, so I'm, in my perspective, general intelligence needs something like general motivation. Rationality itself is but a tool. There is no rational reason to get up in the morning at all. And the reason why we do things is not because we typically be a, because we are intelligent, but because mostly we are, because we are primates that use a specific kind of intelligence that enable us to do other things uh, than most primates can do. But the goals themselves, they do come from us um, being the result of the biological evolution, which uh, tends to in, in, uh, view us with certain action tendencies. The motivational system is what structures our cognition and what attaches relevance to content of our cognition and our interaction with the world. Um, the motivational dynamics uh, provide us with alternating behaviors that structure our um, 
strategies in very interesting ways. So the reason why we are not paperclip uh, optimizers or something like this is because we have to um, serve many uh, different goals. If we have an AI, an AI evolution that, for instance, has as a fitness function only the competition for bandwidth after the world has been turned into computronium, maybe the result is not very interesting at all, but we get something like a very smart but very boring virus that is just very good at replicating itself and uh, winning over other uh, solutions. And the thing that makes us so interesting in, in my perspective is probably the result of particular constraints that have been built into us. For instance, our brains are uh, relatively small, but they cannot grow larger because they already consume 20% of the glucose of our body, so the whole system doesn't scale very well. So at a, a certain point, if you want to become smarter, we have to collaborate with other individuals and specialize, and this uh, makes it necessary for us to uh, have a bunch of social drives that structure um, the social interaction. And our cognition, arguably, and our rationality is informed by this need for collaboration, which is not necessarily a given in an AI, because in AI, it's not clear why it wouldn't scale and why you would need to have several of them and why it would get better if you have several of them, not just one that integrates over all of them. So it's just one of the many examples that is informed by the particular needs of human individuals. That's why I'm also not quite convinced whether it's a, if it's a good idea to take human values and put them into an AGI, uh, especially if you look at the fact that uh, human values do not uh, seem to guarantee human survival or survival at all on, the, on this planet. Um, Nevertheless, I do want to understand how these uh, human motivational processes work because m uh, one of my main goals when I pursue AGI is that I want to understand how the mind works and how humans work, not necessarily in uh, the specific case of humans because I see them as a, just one of the very few examples of a working general intelligence that we can study so far. So uh, what the motivational system needs to provide is attention selection and action control. And, and one thing that I'm also interested in is in uh, understanding the relationship between motivation and emotion, emotion and, uh, motivation and affect. Uh, our architecture has been largely documented in this book, Principles of Synthetic Intelligence. Uh, work on it started uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, this book is also partially based on theory by Dietrich Dörner, a German cybernetician and a theoretical psychologist who, uh, whom I indebted to with the basic framework of how to do the uh, decomposition of a system uh, that is able to come up with goals on its own. MicroSci is a neurosymbolic architecture that is uh, it's built on spreading activation networks uh, that uh, have both symbolic and distributed properties. It's basically, uh, the idea is that you have a homogeneous representation uh, and different operations on them. So associative thinking, analytical thinking, um, largely use the same representational content, but it's a different class of, uh, of operations that works on them. And uh, the agents are all implemented uh, within these uh, representational paradigms, which we call node nets. We have uh, uh, representations that are all grounded, so everything that our agents learn and uh, reason about uh, is something that they've experienced in some kind of environment. Usually it's a virtual environment. At some point we also build robots, but because we are not very good at robotics, we didn't learn much from it because um, I think that it's an affliction that currently all systems have. If you build a robot, it's going to experience the world through a very small and dirty window. It's m basically just moving around in a lab floor. And its um, interaction with the world is mostly limited to pushing things and locomoting. Well, except when you're working for the military, then maybe you're also going to blow up things. But it's not like you're going to climb trees and um, build computers or discover fire and uh, do very interesting things right now if you are a robot. So the embodiment that is provided by robots at this point is, uh, in my view, not yet helpful for AI. And it, uh, at this very early stage of our career as AI researchers, um, we are still very well off with using virtual worlds. Um, Microsite right now, this is one example of the node nets. The, um, they uh, run in a uh, browser interface, can be distributed over different machines. Um, at the moment, we have an implementation that is um, based on uh, Theano and uses largely Python for providing the infrastructure to run these node nets. You can uh, download it and play around with it. Uh, lots of parts of it are public and can be played with. Um, a goal in Microsci uh, is a situation or an action that affords to satisfy a need. 
is every action that an agent performs is, uh, that is role-directed is uh, ultimately directed on satisfying a need or avoiding the frustration of another need. And the needs are predefined, the goals are learned. Because when our agents are born, they do not know in which environment they are born, pretty much like humans, and uh, so they cannot know what goals are afforded by the environment. And if you are born into a very flexible open environment like humans are, it's a good idea that you do not pre-wire the goals, but what you do is you pre-wire the needs that the system has, and then it identifies goals through learning. And uh, so we get an architecture that is based on needs, and these needs, um, there are some autonomous processes that try to regulate these needs. For instance, uh, your body temperature might go pretty high, and then you start to sweat, and this is autonomous regulation, and uh, you don't need to uh, think about this, it just happens automatically. But when this autonomous regulation fails, you need to start a cognitive process that tells you, oh, uh, you're getting too hot, maybe you should be doing something about this, maybe you should find a place that uh, is a little bit more shady or a little bit more air conditioned and then you start uh, generating plans on how to enact this, you will establish a goal, you commit to that goal and you act on this plan. And um, this way you establish uh, goals based on needs. For instance, the need would be to maintain a, a certain target temperature uh, for uh, your body to work well and uh, it's if this need cannot be regulated autonomously, you get an urge, and this urge means uh, cool down, and then you establish a goal, and that goal could be something like uh, go to a place with air conditioning, and then you try to construct a plan to enact this. So you get these urge signals, and uh, the urge signals, what they do is they uh, act on your memory content and your perception content and on the space of possible actions by priming them. So uh, when you... Uh, are hungry and you think about things randomly, uh, a lot of things that have, are related to food will pop into your mind and if you look into the world and you're very hungry then uh, you will able to be recognize foodstuffs much better and they will look much nicer to you than they normally would look. So you have some priming uh, and attentional modulation going on there. Uh, then these urge signals are important for learning. Whenever you satisfy an urge, you get a re reinforcement signal, which we perceive as a pleasure signal. When something bad happens, we get uh, a displeasure signal. It's also is a reinforcement. And uh, they uh, uh, establish connections between the urges and situations that we currently experience. And uh, these associations define goal situations. And then we have decision-making, of course, that is, we do have a number of competing urges at a time, so uh, right now I have a strong urge uh, to communicate my ideas to you, and this competes with the urge to sleep. And uh, uh, at the moment, the former is winning and the latter is losing, so the latter is being inhi inhibited uh, at the cost of the former. And the decision-making basically works by balancing those urges and doing some lateral inhibition to make sure that conflicting urges do not win over. Okay, uh, pleasure and distress are signals that are generated by the motivational system. Only five minutes left? Okay. Um, uh, so here, here's an example for this. Uh, we have a bunch of physiological needs, <laughs> thirst, hunger, rest, warmth, um, libido, and so on. Uh, and survival is not an urge by itself, but it's an emergent property uh, of those things. We have a bunch of social needs. These social needs structure our social interaction. and uh, the primary social need might be affiliation, that is, uh, gain attention from others uh, and a sense of belonging. And uh, it, it, what we call external legitimacy, it's transmitted by social signals that other people give to you. You tell you you're basically okay, you are conforming to the expectations that others have uh, at you and uh, you are part of a social group. Uh, then we have something, uh, basically affiliation works like a, a currency. It's a capital, a social capital that is uh, distributed among people in s uh, small populations especially, so they can cooperate with each other and reward each other for cooperation without reducing the fitness of the group by giving actual resources to people or breaking their legs if they do not cooperate. Both which would reduce the overall fitness of the group because they would cost actual resources. So we create, uh, uh, as a nature, in an evolutionary process, a virtual currency, this uh, affiliation signals that enable us to reward each other with praise and smiles and so on, or uh, uh, punish each other by um, um, reputation loss, basically, if we do not cooperate. The whole thing also works when nobody is looking, and this is because we have a sense that uh, gives these signals to ourselves. Um, which we call honor in our culture. It's basically internalized social norms, and whenever we conform to internalized social norms, we give legitimacy signals to ourselves. Of course, these internalized social norms are not identical to the group norms that we have in public. For instance, maybe uh, you are allowed to pick your nose on your own, 
um, but uh, not in public. But uh, there are still things you might not be doing, uh, for instance, stealing food uh, from your a flatmate, uh, because you would feel bad about it, even if you wouldn't get caught. Um, then we have a, a bunch of others, like uh, nurturing the uh, desire to uh, increase others' happiness, uh, romantic affection, which is a desire to get close to others and identify with them, and dominance, the uh, need to uh, climb social hierarchies, and so on. And as we can see, uh, these are not in the same strengths in every person, and uh, interpersonal variance exists by parameterizing those needs. So some people have low desire for dominance or little need for dominance. Some people have an extremely high need for dominance. And this gives rise to uh, varieties within populations, and it meets, makes it possible for our populations to adapt to different environments. Um, we have uh, cognitive needs, especially a need for competence, which uh, amounts to the acquisition of skills. Uh, the general need for uh, ab being able to control our environment and uh, to generate visible effects on it. And we have uncertainty reduction, which basically amounts to an exploratory drive. And we have aesthetics, which are uh, either stimulus-oriented, there are some stimuli that we find intrinsically pleasant because we are hardwired to do so, and uh, structure-oriented, that is abstract aesthetics, structure discovery, basically uh, a reward that we get for finding better representations. Um, all these needs are in a constant competition with each other. There's no uh, Maslow pyramid. I think there's, uh, there's no hierarchy of needs because uh, we all know of these uh, press reports of uh, people in China playing uh, multiplayer games until they fall dead of their chairs because they neglect uh, food, drink, and rest, uh, which basically means that if you are lucky, then the relative strengths of your needs are wired in such a way that you eat before you fall dead of your chair uh, instead of leveling up but it's not the case for all of us. Sometimes it's possible that we forego our physical well-being for social goals, for instance. So uh, we do not need a hierarchy here. Uh, I think that all needs are competing on the same level. Um, a need is represented as something like a tank, and there is a target value and a current value in there, and the difference between the target and the uh, current value is the urge strength. Um, a deviation in the positive direction is what we see as the pleasure uh, signal, a deviation in the negative uh, direction is the displeasure signal, and the strength of the signal is, uh, depends on the shortness of the amount of time which this happened, basically on the delta um, and the time. Um, we use this to cr uh, create associations between the uh, needs uh, signals, between the urge indicators and um, appetitive and aversive goals. And we use this also to strengthen protocol chains and memory that lead up to the situations that are connected to those goals. So we learn automatisms that lead from the current situation to goal situations. And an intention is basically uh, a goal that we have uh, committed to, one of those situations and actions, uh, and a plan that enacts this. And uh, with this mechanism, it's possible to uh, do motivational learning. Due to lack of time, I'm not going to go into the details here, but you'll find the description of this in the paper. It's relatively straightforward to implement. Motive selection is uh, based on base, uh, checking whether um, we can do an autonomous regulation if the need becomes active. So if there is a body process that can do that. If it's not possible, then we trigger an urge signal. If the urge signal is there, then we check in the environment if it's possible to opportunistically satisfy the need. So if there's something directly in front of us that affords satisfying the need without uh, changing our overall plans, we might just, for instance, eat a sandwich without stopping how to program uh, because the sandwich was just put in front of us by uh, some caring core worker and we have an opportunistic way to satisfy that need or to drink some water because we have some glass on the table and we do not need to enact a big plan to do so and we do not disrupt our other goals. If it's that, that's not possible, we need to uh, identify a plan and we do this uh, by comparing the different urges, take their relative strengths, uh, then we uh, compare them against a, sig uh, a suppression signal that basically is an adaptive stubbornness that avoids goal oscillation and uh, then uh, we choose the strongest one to commit to it and I try to identify a strategy that enacts it. And then we calculate the motive strengths by uh, estimating the expected reward, the urgency of uh, satisfying the need, the competence that we have to, basically the chance that we are going to be successful in enacting the plan and dividing this by the cost of the strategy. So we have different motives and we are going to pick the strongest one. And this is a relatively simple function that enables the motivational system to, at uh, any point, commit to a, a motive. If we have, do not find any strategy that we can enact to satisfy our urge, we can 
increased our general need for exploration, which means that even if we do not know what to do, the probability that we start to randomly explore the environment or directly explore the environment increases. So we have a chance to do something about this in the future. Okay, we can parameterize these needs. There's uh, the strength of the need, the relative importance of this, the decay, which tells you how often you need to replenish it, the gain, that is the signal that you get from satisfying the need, and the loss, which is the effect of frustrating the need. And the different configurations of need parameters give rise to different personality traits. In a similar way, we have modulators and um, I'm not going to go into details right now again because of time constraints. So uh, we have uh, six modulator dimensions, arousal, valence, um, uh, aggression submission, which we fight flight responses to the environment, and we have um, uh, attentional modulators, uh, which uh, direct the focus and direction of attention and the resolution that we have in our attentional system, and uh, together they configure cognition at a given time. And parameters of the uh, attentional modulators basically give rise to different temperaments. And, um, whereas the motivational parameters basically define personality types, um, the affective um, parameters, uh, these are personality types in the psychology, the big five, uh, define temperaments. And uh, here's one uh, thing that we have, are currently working on to evaluate this model. This is based on some early work by Richard Bartle, who discovered that when people play computer games like um, multiplayer uh, um, role-playing games, uh, that there are different types of players, and they discover that they are socializers, achievers and explorers, and killers. So highly competitive players, highly explorative players that try to see every corner of the game, uh, uh, players that are basically grinding up their scores and trying to maximize every skill that are the achievers, and then those that are mainly playing this to get social interaction. And the interesting thing is that we can model this very simply by uh, saying that there are some uh, affiliation maximizers, some competence maximizers, and uh, exploration maximizers. And uh, if we extend the model a bit and take our full motivational model in there, we also propose that there are people that are more focused on soci uh, social interaction or on supporting others of uh, being helpful in other groups. And additionally, we have also people that are uh, interested in the hedonic aspects of the game that really want to see nice vistas in the game and want to see, uh, want to have ex um, hedonic experiences in the game. And something that we are currently exploring by uh, looking at behavior uh, of people in role-playing games, um, getting the data from large game companies uh, over play player behavior. Okay, so uh, this is what we're currently doing. I I'm going to stop here. And uh, you can get more information at our MyCoopSci homepage. And I thank you very much for your attention.